We tell young people today, drop out of school, because schools, education today, is the worst narcotic drug of all. Don't politic, don't vote. These are old men's games, impotent and senile old men that want to put you onto their uh, old chess games of war and power. Drop out. Uh, tune in with natural things. Take off your shoes. Uh, get back in tune with God's harmony. Surround yourself with beauty and sacred objects. 1967, everything according to marketeers everywhere in the 1960s was allegedly colourful and loved up. And we were all high as Lucy in the sky. Desmond Morris looked at the naked ape, Basil Rathbone and Vivian Lee went to the big stage in the clouds. The last Mondays of May and August became bank holidays in the UK. Pink Floyd released Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Radio One was launched and the Vietnam War stateside dragged on. All stuffed into a kaleidoscope world of gaudy. The drug scene was seen as chic and the hazy days of pop pills and the wonders of LSD and hippiedom affected fabrics, interiors, all sorts of things, even though the majority of the public were blissfully unaware of the influence, with exception of course to those that lived in certain places and age demographics. The mid to late 60s blasted the drab and conservatism of the 1950s with a uh, rainbow vortex. 1967 was the summer of love and its influence continued for many years after. Oh, and the Avengers burst onto mainly American screens in vivid-ish colour. The United Kingdom still had monochrome sets and colour was only there for the privileged few, but Blighty would catch up later, much later in fact. The Dame Rig colour shows, as well as the Linda Thornton tally plays of the Avengers, would be screened again in 1970, when colour TV was, people were hoping, it would have caught on. To a certain degree, though, many Brits were still watching in black and white well into the late 1970s. It was stateside that the uh, colour trend happened, and a station over there, NBC, set the trend for colour when it decided to go full colour in 1966. American shows such as Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Lost in Space, made the switch from greys, whites and ebonies to the vibrancies of the colourful spectrum with emphasis now on turquoises, lilacs and chartreuse. Fashionably clashing these colours were as well. From its black and white serial cliffhanger at the cinema, Batman was introduced again to television audiences and as the Avengers embraced the engulfment of pop art, a design for living in Paisley through a prism. By the beginning of the colour season 5 and due to the rip-roaring successes of series 4, Dame Diana Rigg was struggling slightly with the trappings of fame, amongst other issues, concerning a highly demanding workload. Dame Rigg was seriously considering to leave poor Patrick McNee on his lonesome as she was pushed to the limit with the arduous recording schedule which was also getting in the way of her love of the stage. It was up to an executive at ABC Productions to practically woo her into staying on 
After negotiating some perks with the actress and her agent, an increase in both the star's salaries and a cut of the profits, which was a double whammy for Dame Diana, helped make her mind up. More so Dame Rig than McNee. It was worth every penny as the two on screen were electric together, and at this time nothing else would do. Now was not the time for any new girl on the block. This was waiting in the wings though. Season 5 for our hero Steed and Mrs. Peel continued with bouillant verve, swank, kitsch and a pop-art prowess akin to the Batman series. A wonderful campy streak running right through the show. It was this unique Britishness that was, and still is, the absolute gravitas, and was the show's most unique selling point, commanding and receiving deserved success where and when the series was screened. The Colour series began filming in 1966 and indulged Dame Rig to realise her devoir with the Royal Shakespeare Company of Stratford. The filming began on Monday the 5th of September 1966 in Hampshire at Palace House in Bewley. McNee here was in his element as a variety of vehicles could be chosen for the actual show and uh, were considered to use in some of the cheeky tag scenes. The Mrs. Peel We Are Needed tag scenes would feature at the beginning and it was also mooted that the car theme was going to be featured at the end with the Avengers driving off in a classic automobile in some scripted witty manoeuvre. Although this touch wasn't popular with ABC and caused a little bit of friction between them and Brian Clemens who continued as a producer alongside Albert Fennell and Julian Wintle remaining as executive producer. ABC were not amused and asked Clemens to do away with it. Clemens disputed the argument by uh, rationalising to the ABC that the tag scenes were in fact an independent matter entirely, almost playing out as mini-episodes on their own volition and merit. Clement added that they were contrived to maintain the audience's interest, a kind of stamp to the series, and because it was so exclusive to the programme, it made the Avengers what it is known and loved for, very quirky indeed. ABC pondered what Clements was saying and grudgingly agreed to leave the tag, sh tag scenes in the show. It should be of note though that when Britain re-screened the colour Diana Rigg serials after their initial and once only repeat um, in 1970, Channel 4 screened them in 1982. Next on Channel 4, Patrick McNee and Diana Rigg in another adventure for the Avengers. This is Channel 4. Don't pop off to bed just yet because Peter Bowles now joins Patrick McNee and Diana Rick in this week's episode of The Avengers. And these tags were indeed cut. The uncut versions of these episodes could only be seen in their full glory when they were released on VHS, DVD and Blu-ray. The monochrome series, when Channel 4 screened The Avengers, followed the colour episodes in about 1984-85. These were intact, thankfully. This is where I came to first watch The Avengers, and love it. The Avengers in Season 5 still kept its Britishness and unorthodox demeanour. 
By now, with this colour season, the programme became synonymous with style and a trendy pedigree, benchmark by Series 4, as well as the series having some sort of fixation on a somewhat awry perception of the world around us. The producers always stood by these essentials prerequisites to format the show, but supplemented even higher jeopardy, leaving Emma Peel and John Steed perilous to every villainous dexterity. The more hazardous, the better. Brand new peculiarities and digressions were supplemental to allow Steed to react to such menace with a element of blitheness, whilst Mrs. Peel favoured a battle with the bad guys or wicked women with a whack of a fist or a swift kick. Of course, a charming flick of a swarthy auburn locks when all is avenged is a delightful touch at times. As ABC, productions felt that the spy cycle was becoming passé for television. The villains now were mainly a private sector of scoundrels. Diabolical despots were now up to their chicanery in order to rule, enslave or destroy the world. And such fantastical plot lines usurped those of foreign powers as the Avengers soldiered on with its chic blending of sass, slight gallows humour, visionary and experimental direction, and at times, flawless congeniality. Season 5 embraced the new zeitgeist of psychedelia as it had the mod and post-modernism in season 4. Viewers of the previous season enjoyed immensely the science fiction episodes, so research indicated, so many of the colour stories were oblique in such a favoured direction. Brian Clemens said, when you're dealing with a make-believe world populated by larger-than-life villains, it is difficult to not get into bizarre situations. The science fiction thing was unintentional. Ideas were easy for that. It was finding writers with an Avenger's mind. Other adjustments in the programme was the technique used by Emma Peel to deal with conflict. Now, the choice of combat here was Kung Fu, a 2,000-year-old form of self-defense based on a more meditative and spiritual form of sparring than the ferine clout of karate and judo. Dame Rig also learned the nuts and bolts of Tai Chi as well, which enabled a series of balletic, balletic movements essential to her demeanour, breath intake and ultimate repose. These were also mixed in with the sparring sequences. <laughs> Thank you. 
Unfortunately, in my opinion, was the fade out of her leather armour for our superheroine. For Series 5, the costume designer Baton was handed to Alan Hughes, who, with Dame Rig's blessing and request, wanted to do away with it, as they both felt it was more a Kathy Gale thing. The fighting costume here for Emma Peel were vivid stretch jersey and crimpoline cat suits, which were fondly named as Emma Peelers, giving a head to toe all in one visual. Set designers were also requested to configure the environment for each episode to showcase both Steed and Emma's costumes and wardrobe finery as best they possibly could. The emphasis on Dame Rig's costume here was on the feline as well as the feminine. Pierre Cardin designed Steed's togs, bringing in breast pockets replete with handkerchiefs and trousers with lateral lineage, from the knee to the ankle giving a slightly flared effect. Steed's brollies and bowlers also changed in hue to match McNee's new wardrobe. Here Steed looks at his most impeccable and dapper. The Edwardian star was also a favourite with the fashionistas of Carnaby Street, so would have most certainly appealed to the now generation of this swinging era. After 13 episodes were in the can, there was a small respite. This break was also reflected on TV with a gap of a few months, seeing the story Who's Who ending the season midway in the May and the return of the Cybernauts starting things off again in the September of 1967 in the London region. Depending on where you lived depended on the days of transmission. Some were a staple of the Saturday night entertainment and some on a Friday night. For such a now celebrated show, the scheduling still wasn't harmonised, which is rather surprising. In season 5 there were a total of 25 episodes, including the crossover story The Forget Me Not, which saw the introduction of Steed's new avenging friend. In this wacky world of variegated, thorny turpitude, Steed and Emma feud with a melange of fiendish tyranny, and this is where it can be considered the Avengers reached their absolute ne plus ultra. The first story that was shown in most UK regions was called From Venus with Love, which looked as though our duo were preventing the Earth from being invaded from beyond the stars. The Fear Merchants followed, which saw businessmen involved in the ceramics trade turning up dead, killed by fright. Villains manipulating the animal kingdom was used to full effect in two stories. One was The Bird Who Knew Too Much, where pigeons were used as aeronautical shutterbugs, and Pretty Polly sent hush-hush memorandums. And in one of the best of the episodes, called The Hidden Tiger, it sees Ronnie Barker balance comic and sinister as a character called Cheshire, who, via a small piece of technology in Kitty Cat's collar, brings out the beast in Poor Pussin on its unsuspecting victims. Who's Who, as we mentioned previously, gives our two main heroes a bit of respite where their personalities are switched. Another interesting episode is Agatha Christie-inspired tale, or which was called The Superlative Seven, which is similar to Season 3's Dress to Kill, as a young day Donald Sutherland dresses up her and Charlotte Rampling, who are part of an elite group of assassins specialising in one field of deadly combat or another. Now these guys abduct poor Steed, only to find there is a bigger baddie intent on bumping them off one by one. For once here in this story, and unusually, it's Mrs. Peel who rescues Steed from such villainy. Dead Man's Treasure starts out as a jolly romp with a fast car-paced treasure hunt theme, and it ends in an awesome finale with Emma Peel cuffed to a steering wheel, and if she dares veer off the road, then she will be fatally shocked with a thousand volts or more of electricity. 
Another outstanding episode is uh, Return of the Cybernauts, which saw the mechanical menaces revive this time with uh, Peter Cushing taking over the lead role of the arch-villain from Michael Goff. The Positive Negative Man saw assassinations being carried out by a deadly digit as one finger touch results in the incineration of the victim. Christopher Lee starred in Never Never Say Die, who commands robotic doppelgangers to carry out such diabolical deeds. The Joker, which is one of my own personal highlights of this season, based on the uh, season 3 black and white Kathy Gale story Don't Look Behind You, is a standalone Emma Peel story where pop art visuals kiss gothic in a story which could be the Avengers at its most chilling and eerie. From the sublime to the wonderfully ridiculous in an episode called The Winged Avenger, a comic book hero comes to life and strikes back at those who did him wrong. This episode is pure pop art, a total symphony to this art form and represents to me what the 1960s was all about. Mission Highly Improbable swaps large for little as Steed shrinks giving the viewer pure fantasy, combining decent special effects with witty dialogue and eyebrow raising double entendre. Well, you're real enough, but how? Rushton built some infernal machine. Chivers used it on the tank. And you just happened to be inside. How did you guess? Tell me, Steve. Is everything to scale? <laughs> Death's Door sees mind over matter and focuses on the power of subliminal mind control, similar and akin to last season's Too Many Christmas Trees. Season 5 was rounded off by the Forget-Me-Not, a story that some consider this to be the first Linda Thornson story, but I lump this into the last Emma Peel category, as one companion here bids farewell in a lump in the throat ending. Steed also gains a mother, played by Patrick Newell, a mainstay in the Thornson episodes. And another, of course, new companion joined Steed for the next and last season of Daring Do. Tarara Boom Die! Always keep your bowler on in times of stress. And watch out for diabolical. 